There we go. Now we have sound. All right. Everybody have a good lunch? Okay. Well, hopefully it wasn't too good. Don't fall asleep. Okay. Mine was good. Mine was really good. So there we go. <laughs> so, and I promise, we, I promise you I will not fall asleep <clears throat> while I'm preaching. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we, I actually had Cajun chicken breast. So it was good. Yes. <clears throat> I like the spicy food. So that's good. Yes, if you do have questions also, you can write them down and uh, <clears throat> either give them to them at the table or bring them up here and leave them on here. And I will, uh, we should be able to get to those uh, hopefully today. I will check that out in just a minute. But if you have your manuals, <clears throat> turn with me to, we're going to go to section four, still in section four, <clears throat> page 39. We started in Matthew chapter nine, verse 35 at the bottom of the page. I don't think we got very far, but uh, we're going to pick it back up, and I'll just start from verse 35 again. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Notice, he was moved with compassion, all right? Then saith he unto his disciples, <clears throat> The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And notice, going with me to page 40. <clears throat> Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. As I've said before, that word send forth is a Greek word that literally, it's the same Greek word used when it said cast out devils. <clears throat> so he said, Pray that the Lord of the harvest will cast out laborers, right? And I always tell everybody it's easier to cast out devils than it is to cast out Christians <clears throat> because devils know they have to listen. Christians think they get to choose, right? If Jesus is your Lord, you don't get to choose your obedience, right? If Jesus is Lord, everything is just yes, sir, real simple. <clears throat> so it says in verse chapter 10, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, notice right here. It does not say <clears throat> that he gave them power to cast out devils or heal the sickness that God wanted healed. It doesn't say he gave them power to heal the sick that God wanted healed. It says he gave them power against sickness, all sickness and all disease. To heal all sickness and all disease. You get that? See, here's where our problem is. We have heard so much about making Jesus our personal Savior, right? That the church has taken the gospel and made it about us and made it more humanism than gospel salvation. And we tell people, if you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have come and died for you. Is that true? Yeah, of course. But the problem is now we have developed that to a point <clears throat> that we think it's all about us. We think God exists to bless us. We think God exists to heal us. We think, in other words, we're the center of the universe and God exists to meet our needs. That's the way the gospel has been twisted, right? We have to remember he's God. We're the creation. We serve him. You get that? He doesn't serve us. He blesses us. That's true. But, but we, we are here to serve him. He's God and we're not. Amen? <clears throat> so... The problem is we have made healing a reward instead of warfare. And because of that, we make it a reward for good living. Well, if you get all the sin out, well, if you live right, if you live holy, if you're good enough, you know, I've even heard people talk about trying to receive the baptism of the Spirit, and they tell them, well, you know, if you'll, if you'll take those, the, those earrings out, if you'll take your, your necklaces, if you take your jewelry off, God will you know, fill you with the Holy Ghost. Well, if God's got a problem with jewelry, he's got a problem with Jesus because he has a girdle around him made of gold, right? So if God's got a problem with gold, I, had, I heard one person one time say, well, if you'll take that wedding band off because that's jewelry, let me think about it. And that's like whenever I got out of the Air Force, you know, in the Air Force, all we could have was a mustache. Couldn't have a beard, nothing like that. <clears throat> so I had a mustache. I knew that God wanted me to preach, at that time, all I knew pretty much was, well, the, the Baptist church, 
and I knew that God could heal. I had been raised around Pentecostals, but I didn't know that much about it. And so I went to a missionary Baptist church to talk to the pastor. And this was in the town where my dad was the police, uh, chief of police. <clears throat> so it was a small town. And so I went to him and I said, uh, yeah, I know that God has called me to preach. And I, you know, I'm interested in how do I do this? How do I go into ministry? First thing he said, sitting across his desk, he looked at me and goes, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to shave that mustache. God can't use you with a mustache. He can't use you with that hair on your face. And I'm like, really? And I was, you know, young at this point, right? <clears throat> and he, but I wasn't stupid, not that stupid anyway. And I said, so God's power won't flow through me because of my mustache. So my mustache is more powerful than God's power. Exactly, the opposite, yeah, it's the opposite of Samson anointing. That's what it would have been. <laughs> but it was amazing because he, he was 100%. Yeah, that's right. Yep, you got to shave that mustache. And I'm like, okay. And I left and everyone went back. Why? Because I ain't that stupid to go back twice, right? <clears throat> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? So I just left and everyone went back. <clears throat> but it was amazing because that's how people thought. Now, but what we've done is we've taken healing and we've made it so individual as though God is looking at your life and going, okay, healing, yes, no, maybe, here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to work. To, and we make it all about us, and it turns around, and it becomes all about selfishness again because our, our focus is on us. And we have to realize, in, in reality, healing is like a class action lawsuit. That it, In a class action lawsuit, the individual really doesn't matter. Now, I know that could hurt some people's feelings, but, you know, get over it. All right. It's a class action lawsuit. In other words, to get involved in a class action lawsuit, your name doesn't matter. All that you have to prove is were you injured by that product or by that company or whatever it was, and you get in on the lawsuit. So all you have to do is prove damage on that thing, right, to you from that thing. That's the way healing is. God is not pulling a switch. God does not have 8 billion switches in heaven that he has to pull with everybody's name on it that he has to pull to let his power flow through. You know, oh, today is so and so. I'm going to get them healed. Or I'm going to go over here and pull this lever here. And now the healing power is going to flow to that. That's not how it works. God's power is mechanical. And we can see that because <clears throat> everything around us shows the organization and the mechanics of it. Even the solar system is mechanical. God put all that in play and now it's working. And in healing, instead of making it a, an individual thing, if you see yourself as part of a class action lawsuit, now you get the benefit of the settlement. And the settlement was, by his stripes, you were healed. All you have to do is prove that you were injured by the one doing the injuring. Well, who did the injuring? Well, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Every person Jesus healed was oppressed of the devil. Not one of them were oppressed by God. Not one of them were oppressed by the Father. It was always the devil. And so the devil is the oppressor. And so if, if all we have to look and see is that if all sickness comes from the devil, then we're under that part of the class action lawsuit. And so any person can be healed if they get in on the settlement. And the settlement was, by his stripes, you were healed. Amen? Do you see the difference there? So God is not determining or looking at you individually to determine your healing. All God is saying is, do you believe that by his stripes, in other words, the devil injured you, do you want to be in on this settlement? Yes. Okay, then you believe. How do you get in? You believe. What do you believe? What the settlement says. What does the settlement say? By his stripes, you were healed. The minute you believe that, you're healed. Do you get that? Now, in the spirit... You're healed already. You're, okay, let's get to it. You are a spirit. Isn't that right? You are a spirit. <clears throat> you have a soul, and you live in a body. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, so you're a three-part being. The real you, the real you, is the spirit. Is that right? So your body isn't even the real you. Right? Amen. There we go. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so... Since your body isn't the real you, and your spirit is. Your spirit got recreated when you got born again, right? So your spirit is perfect and complete. So technically, you will never be sick another day in your life. 
your body might get sick, but you will never be sick again. Why? Because your body is in your spirit. Amen? So when you say, well, by his stripes I'm healed, you say, well, I don't want to say it, you know, because I, I could be lying, you know, because I'm not healed. Well, you are healed. Now, your body may need healing, but your body, the healing of your body has already been paid for. Amen? But you, the real you, the spirit you, because right now, I mean, think about it. If your body is you, uh, when you're, you know, what, what happens, the Bible says that when you're, the body without the spirit is dead. Well, if the body is you, how can you be there and yet your spirit be gone? What is that spirit part of you? You see? But the spirit is you. So you will never be sick another day in your life. So you should be able to say, by his stripes I'm healed, knowing that it's your body that's being corrected. Do you get it? Now, your body has to come into alignment with the Word of God. Your spirit's in alignment with God and will never be out of alignment with God. You got that? Now, watch, because he goes on. The whole point... And, and we're talking about healing like Jesus, right? How did Jesus heal, right? So it says here, in the, and, and again, I want to emphasize, this is not a, we make it too personal because we want a personal God. And he's, you know, as we said, a personal Savior. And I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying that he does not deal individually like that. Because if that's true, then you ought to have a Bible with your name in it instead of whosoever, you get that? If the Bible doesn't have your name, you say, well, I have a personalized Bible. I have my name put in. Okay. You did that, right? I'm saying, if God has a different will for every person, then there ought to be 8 billion Bibles. I'm not talking about 8 billion copies. I'm talking about 8 billion individual Bibles telling you, and all you got to do is find the right Bible with your name on it. Does that make sense? But God doesn't have 8 billion wills. He's got one will. It is good, it is perfect, and it is acceptable, right? And the first part of that will, if you don't get into that, the first part of his will is that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When you get into that, that's the first stage of stepping into the will of God. And then the second stage, Dr. Lake says, is that you actually uh, submit your will to his will to do his will, right? <clears throat> but you have to find out what that is. And then you got people that say, well, but God's will for my life is to do this. and this. No, his will for your life is that you get born again, that you get healed, that you get filled with the Spirit of God, and that you grow up to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, and talk like Jesus. That's his will for your life. You say, well, what about his will about where I work and all that? Uh, I'm not saying that God can't put you places and that he doesn't necessarily have places for you at times, but most of that is, what do you want? Right, And then he goes along with that. But if you have two choices, you can ask him and he will give you the better choice. He will tell you, take this, don't take that. Right? Why? Because you're going to quit this job and you're going to go to that company. And three months from now, that company is going to go under. You don't want to do that. So you listen to the wisdom of God and he actually will then uh, cause you to make the right choice. Amen? Do you see that? So it's not, now I'm not saying God doesn't know or that God doesn't have a will for your life. He does have a will for your life. But that will is that you grow up to look like Jesus. That's his will, right? And so in that, now, different people are in different places, and they will grow up to look like Jesus different ways. But all you have to realize is that if whatever job you're in, whatever you're doing, what would Jesus look like if he were in that job? How would he do it? You say, well, he would do this, he would do that. Okay, that may be true. But you have to remember, too, <clears throat> that no matter what he's doing, he's going to be there with power, so I don't care if you're a bank teller or a salesman or anything else, you're still going to pray for the sick. You're still going to lay hands on the sick. Sick. You're still going to, the, the gifts of the Spirit will still be functioning through you. Amen. Do you understand that? And so I'm not saying he doesn't have a will. I'm going to have to get this thing fixed. It keeps flopping around. <laughs> there we go. Pull on that ear. Can't pull on this one like that. It'll come off. No, anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. But notice, first off, that first section there, I want to get back into the purpose of this. You'll notice from Matthew 9.35 to Matthew 10.1, laborers were ordained not because they were special or good or anything else or super holy. They were ordained because of compassion of Jesus. Do you get that? He had compassion on them, and then he called forth laborers. Why? Because he saw the multitude and knew he could not get to everybody. So then, look at the next one, Matthew 14.14. 14. Matthew 14, 14, we start 
And it says, yes, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. He was moved with compassion and healed the sick. Why did, he, why did he heal the sick? He was moved with compassion. Right? Now, what's the definition of compassion? Love in action. When you are filled with love to the point where it makes you move, that's compassion. Okay? Matthew 20, verse 29. <clears throat> and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. The multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Now, why, now think about this. Why would he ask that? Why didn't he just say, Oh, well, uh, well Lord, we want mercy. See, we, Lord, ha have mercy on us. Well, were they wanting mercy, or they were wanting to be healed of their blindness? Well, they wanted both. Why? Because mercy and getting healed is the same thing, right? They asked for mercy. They got healed. And yet the Bible tells us that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. So if mercy is healing, then healing should follow us all the days of our life, isn't it? And the mercies of God are new every day, isn't that right? So every day we should have healing if we need it, amen, if mercy is healing. And here he said, they're asking for mercy, but they wanted healing. Now watch, because he said, here's, according to our modern theology, here's what Jesus should have said. Now what he actually said was this, what will ye that I shall do unto you? Well, he shouldn't, according to our theology, he shouldn't have said that. He should have said, eh, hold your peace, don't say anything. I'm going to give you what God wants you to have. I know the God, what is your will? Do you want me to heal them or not? See, he didn't do that. He said, what do you want me to do? And then they said, watch this, that our eye, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Every time Jesus would ask somebody, what do you want me to do? They would tell him, and he'd do it. Matter of fact, he was so eager to heal that we know in Matthew 8, when he talks about the Roman centurion coming to him, if you read the scripture, don't read the way you've been taught it, maybe, but just read it the way it says it. And it says that the Roman centurion came to him beseeching him. And he said that when he said, he, the Roman centurion told him, uh, my servant lies at home sick of a palsy. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. So apparently he interrupted G the, the centurion. He didn't even give him time to finish his statement. Why? Because we know <clears throat> for a fact that the centurion was not going to ask him to come heal him. How do we know that? Because when Jesus offered, what did he do? He said, when he offered him it, he said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. So he had no intentions of Jesus coming to his house. He had no intentions of asking Jesus to go with him. That's why Jesus said, wow, look at this faith. He said, Lord, I understand authority. I'm a man under authority. I tell this man to go, he goes. Another man to come, he comes. I tell this man to do this, he does it. I tell my servant to do this, he does it. This is, I understand authority. If you just speak and say, my servant, if you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not found this kind of faith. Now, you haven't seen, there's nothing, no mention of faith there. <clears throat> so according to Jesus, he said, I have not found this kind of faith in all of Israel. Right? In other words, the greatest faith Jesus ever saw was not in an Israelite. It was not in a person who had a covenant with God. It was in a Gentile. It was in a person who had no covenant with God. You get that? So here a non-covenant, you, you do realize none of these people were born again, so unborn again people can have faith in God. Can you agree? Yes. You better agree because if you can't, you're not saved. Because the minute you had faith in him, you got, that's how you got saved was by having faith, and before then you were not saved. So unsaved, faith, unsaved people can have faith, right? And if unsaved people can have faith, how much more faith should saved people have? Okay? If you had enough faith to get you saved, why wouldn't you? Okay, we always talk, see this is, this is where Christians, um, they, they, I'm going to have to fix this thing. <laughs> Get it. Stay, stay. Need tape. <laughs> Probably help. Um, but it's amazing because Christians give lip service. They will say, well, you know, the greatest miracle. What is the greatest miracle? Getting born again. Isn't that right? Would you agree? Greatest miracle is getting born again? Okay, that's, that's true, right? I'm, I'm agreeing with you 100%. This isn't a trick statement, okay? The greatest miracle you'll ever experience is getting born again, right? But it's funny because we will talk about it 
And we tell everybody, oh, that's the greatest miracle. That's the greatest miracle. And then you say, yeah, but I don't know if God can, I don't know if I have enough faith for God to heal me. Well, you've already experienced the greatest miracle. If you had faith for the greatest miracle, shouldn't it be kind of easy for you to have faith for anything less? But what do we do? We make, well, I just don't know if I have enough faith. I, you know, and we try to sound humble. I don't know how much faith I have. I don't know if I have enough faith. Listen, when you talk about not having enough faith in God for him to do something, you're not being humble. You're actually being very proud. Because what you're saying is, <clears throat> you're actually telling God, you know, God, I just don't know if I can trust you. Because that's what faith is. Faith is just trusting God that he'll do what he said. And then we try to sound humble. Well, I just don't know if I have enough faith for this. What you're actually saying is, God, I just don't know if I can trust you that much because, you know, I'm not sure you hadn't lied about this. And we turn it around and make it into something else rather than realizing that faith is just trusting God. And he, he tells us to resist the devil. First, he says, submit yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves. Isn't that right? Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. And he says, and resist the devil. So first, submitting yourself to God, humbling yourself before God, means accepting what his word says, even above what you think. So that's the first key to being to true humility. It's saying, God, I, I don't feel worthy, I don't feel this, but you said this, so I'm taking it. Because you said it. It has nothing to do with how I feel. It just has to do with what you said. And I'm submitting myself under what you said. Amen? So, <clears throat> the sick multitude... Uh, was healed. Blindness was healed because of compassion, right? <clears throat> Laborers were ordained because of compassion. So why did Jesus heal? It's pretty simple, compassion. But see, we have this idea that he was walking along, and as he walked past this person, God said, heal that one. So he reached out and grabbed that person. Real. Here, I want to heal you because God said, heal you. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. This is a theology that's been built up. What the Bible says is that he went about doing good and healing. All the world pressed the devil. So anywhere he saw it, he fixed it. Anywhere they came to him and said, help me, he did. He never turned anybody down, never turned anybody away. What is amazing to me, okay, just think about this. <clears throat> You've got Jesus healing multitudes. And not one time did he ever start to lay hands. There's nothing recorded where he ever started to lay hands on it and say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have enough faith. Go get some more faith, and when you get enough, come back, and I'll, I'll heal you. You ever realize that? He never turned anybody away for lack of faith. Why do we think, okay, if he would not turn away unbelievers, why would he turn away his own people? Do you get that? If we've already believed in the greatest miracle, why can't we believe for lesser miracles? Amen? Amen. See, this is the thing. Most of our theology hasn't been thought through. We hear things spewed out. And we don't think them through. And we just say, oh, that sounds good. That sounds holy. Yeah, you know, because I'll take condemnation. I'm probably not as good as I should be, so I'll, I'll take that. God probably won't heal me until I get all the sin out of my life. God probably won't do this until I do this right or until the... Listen, I don't need a God that shows up when everything's right. You ever notice that? Well, we're going to create an atmosphere for miracles. Uh, the atmosphere for miracles is, cause, uh, is called a need, right? As soon as there's a need, there's an atmosphere for miracles. Amen. But what do we mean? See, that's the problem. Our theology and healing most of the time in the church today only works, if it works at all, which is seldom, but it only works in church. Right? Why? You think you're going to get an atmosphere in Walmart? You think you're going to, well, how do we get an atmosphere in church? Well, we've got to play the right music. We've got to have it just right. We've got to get everything just right. Everybody's going to be in the right place. Everybody's, we've got to be in one accord. We can't be. You going to fix that? Thank you. You, we we got to be in one accord. We can't have any division. No unbelief. we got to get all the unbelief. If somebody doesn't get healed, it's because there's somebody here with unbelief. Now think about that. If that's true, why send a missionary anywhere? Because anywhere they go, there's going to be unbelief. That's why they're going there is because of their unbelief. So if unbelief stops the power of God, we can't send missionaries. Because it would be ridiculous to send a missionary if unbelief is going to stop the power of God. And it, you see how we just think so strange. And yet we tell them, well, we got to get the right atmosphere. We got to get sister so-and-so when she's anointed to sing that song. <laughs> if, she, if we can get her, if, if, you know, we make sure the anointing is on her. If we can get her to sing that song. Remember last time she sang that song and the anointing was on her. Uh, you remember he, sister so-and-so got healed out, and I, just right out and, and nobody even had to pray for her. It was amazing. So let's get, the, let's get the organist up there. Let's get the, the, the right song. What song were they playing? Let's go back and find out what song they were playing because that song was anointed. 
We've got to get the right person singing it. They've got to be anointed. And we've got to create the atmosphere so the Holy Spirit can work. Do you realize that only works, like I said, in a church? Because you're not going to have that atmosphere in Walmart. Right? I, don't, I don't care what you do. You're not going to be able to walk into Walmart, hand them your worship CD, and say, would you put this on the PA system? Because I'm going to be on aisle three setting people free. But I need an atmosphere first. See, well, see when we talk about it, it sounds stupid. But yet, that's what we've done for years. You know, it's got to be this, got to be that. We act like God is some spoiled rock star that won't perform, you know, unless he's got the right M&Ms in his bowl, rather than realizing he is the God of heaven and earth. You know, and, then, and the sad part is we are born of him. He, we are recreated in his likeness and image. We are new creations. We are as close to being like him as he can make somebody. Do you get that? In our spirit. And yet you look at how most Christians live. And if you look at them, they don't live like Jesus. Matter of fact, to find people that look more like sons of God, you've got to go to the Old Testament and look at the Old Testament prophets. Look at why, why, what makes you think that God would have all this power, do all these amazing things through these prophets who were not born again. They were looking forward to our day. And yet we keep looking back to their day. And he's saying, oh, Lord, oh, the days of Elijah. Oh, if we can have the days of Elijah. And Elijah's yelling, oh, if I had your days, I'd do something with it. <laughs> you know, that we're wishing we were in that time, and he's wishing he had what we have. And so, and you look at how Elijah lived and what he did. Half the stuff he did, he didn't even talk to God about. He just did it. I mean, think, look at the Old Testament. You got Elijah. And he's over there, and some kids come out, start calling, calling him old baldy, right? And he, he doesn't even do And the bears come out and eat him just because they spoke against him. I mean, think about that. That's pretty bold, right? You know, and you look at uh, Elijah calling them fire from heaven. And you look at, and we're, we'll probably talk some more about this a little bit later on, maybe if we get a chance. But they did these things, and half the time they didn't even ask God what to do about it. They just did it. Why? Because they walked with God and his spirit was with them, but his spirit wasn't in them. His spirit's in us. And see, here comes Jesus walking as another prophet, and that's how people saw him. They didn't see him as necessarily the Messiah. They didn't know who he was, and it wasn't revealed to everybody. Jesus said, told Peter, flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, but my father, the spirit of my father, he's done it. So you've got people that didn't even know what he, he was just a prophet to them. And yet, then you got two of his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, that they leave a city because the city didn't want him. And they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire? We'll burn that city up. Let's go. We they acted like they could actually do it. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. He didn't say, don't be foolish. You can't do that. He didn't say that. He said, no, no, no. Listen, that's not what I'm here for. You don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to destroy men, but I came to save men. You see? He didn't say they couldn't do it. I mean, look in the New Testament. Some things happen. I mean, let's go back to Ananias and Sapphira. See, we act like everything's good and you can do anything and, you know, God can't do anything. And some people almost like they're shaking their fist in God's face saying, you can't do anything because I have grace. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. They were under the age of grace too, right? See, there's a lot of these things that we don't even look at. But if you also go back and look, you don't find God speaking in those situations. You see men speaking and proclaiming judgment. He said, they're coming to, to your, your husband. You, your husband died, and now the guys that are carried him off, they're coming for you too. You don't see God speaking in that. You see Peter proclaiming something, and these people dying. All right, let me, let me throw another one at you, right, while we're thinking, all right? Well, I got you in a thinking mode. You know, in, in um, <clears throat> Corinthians, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, uh, there's, there's somebody in your group, somebody in your church there, that is committing sin that is so bad that even the heathen don't do that kind of sin. Remember that? And he said, it's reported that this man has his, his father's wife and all this stuff and all that's going on, right? And then he said, and I've given this guy time to repent, and he hadn't. Now, notice what Paul says. So I, this is my judgment, my judgment. He didn't say, God told me to do this. He said, this is my judgment, and I have turned him, this person, over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved. Might be. 
Doesn't say it will be. Said so that it might be saved. In other words, I have turned and notice this to show you how wrong our theology has been. He said, I have turned him over to Satan. And here's what he did. First, he told them, he said, put him out of the church. Don't let him stay in there because if you let that sin go on there, it's going to spread and everybody's going to think it's okay to sin, right? Well, we're kind of at that point now in the church. And so here he says, so I, I, I have determined, I've already judged, now put him out. Then after a while, the man repented and he had to write back to him and say, okay, he repented, let him back in, right? They weren't even going to let him in because Paul said, kick him out. But now Paul said in the beginning, he said, I have turned this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, let me ask you this, because we think as soon as we mess up, Satan's there. Why? Because we've been told if I mess up, I give him authority to come into my life and do something because I have sinned. Well, here's a man that was sinning and he and Satan wasn't destroying his life until Paul said, I have turned him over to Satan. Notice he didn't say, and I've turned this man over to God, and God's going to get him. God's going to get him because he's sinning. So when, notice it's not God in charge of the destruction of the flesh. It's Satan. Do you see that? And Satan couldn't even touch this man until the apostle over that church gave permission and turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Even though he was committing sin. Satan couldn't get to him as long as he was under the protection of that church. Now, I know this goes against everything I was ever taught, but it's what it says. And see, once the bad part is once you believe the Bible, you've got to believe all of it. And you can't pick and choose. But now notice it says later on he repented. And see, people would say, well, see, uh, that sickness, the destruction of his flesh, whatever it was that happened to him, that Satan brought on him, uh, apparently uh, that got him saved again and got him back in the church and does well it was good that he turned around but and paul was hoping that he would but still notice the destruction of the flesh that was because paul had turned him over now the good thing is most people don't walk in any level of authority in christ to be able to do that you know so before you get all nervous about it don't get nervous about it. your pastor going to turn you over to satan okay first off repent get the sin out and don't cause your pastor any problems Right? Just that simple. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> but if our theology was correct, as soon as that man started sinning, if Satan was in charge of that and just could come in anytime he wanted, then Satan should have already had that guy already. But he didn't. Why? Because this man was in the church. And, and notice, again, I can't emphasize enough, it was Satan that was in charge of the destruction of the flesh, not God. Amen? I mean, I know Jack Coe preached a great sermon called God will burn your barley fields, right? And he was telling God will get you. And, and, you know, a lot of people got saved because of it. But it doesn't talk about God burning your barley fields, right? And we have to realize sometimes that some of the things we've heard might not be exactly accurate, right? So if you look at the, go back to the Word of God and see what it said. Now, again, why did Jesus do these things? Because of compassion, because of compassion, right? He came to show us our year of acceptance, not the day of vengeance, right? So he says here, <clears throat> watch this, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him and saying unto him, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. Now, notice this. When he said, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. That word will is not just, well, if you'll do it. it, it is a, it's an amazing word. It's a small word, but it means, it has a big meaning in the Greek. And it literally means this. If you look it up, I, I challenge you to look it up, go into it, and it says, this word wilt, it's the Greek word othello, and it literally means <clears throat> something done um, because it is the nature and the will of the person doing it. It's their nature and their character to do it. So when he said, Lord, if you really want to, if you desire to do this, if this is who you are, you can make me clean. And Jesus answered and said, this, this is my desire because this is my nature. This is my character. It's who I am. Now, we also know just like in English, we have tenses. Past tense, future tense, present tense. Well, the Greek have like, I think, what, eight tenses, something like that. And so they've got a bunch of tenses, right? Well, the tense of this word is what they would call the continuous tense. 
In other words, when he said, I will, he didn't say I will. He said, I am always willing because it's my nature and my character. Do you get that? So whenever he told this leper, he wasn't just saying, yeah, let me see. For you, yeah, I can do this because God said I can heal you. No, as you have to realize whatever Jesus did was representative of the whole. And so whenever he said, I will, he said, he's literally saying in the Greek, this is who I am. It's my nature. It's my character. And I am always willing to heal. That one verse should all forever end the idea that it might not be God's will to heal just because of the wording used, right? Now, so <clears throat> he was here, leprosy was healed of compassion. Now look at Mark chapter 5, verse 18. Mark 5, 18. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for you and has had compassion on you. Why did the demon get cast out? Because Jesus had compassion. You can, listen, <clears throat> it's amazing. There are about seven different ways that Jesus healed, ways that he healed. Spoken word, laying out of hands, some unusual methods sometimes, you know, making spittle, and that kind of, which is an anointing or a gift nobody wants, right? <laughs> but it's different ways. Uh, he, he, he healed, uh, well, we would say he healed. God heals through even what people call prayer claws, even though they're not called that. Oh, there we go. That they're not called prayer claws, but they, because it doesn't say that Paul ever, pre, or ever prayed over them. It just said that he wore them, right? See, again, it's amazing. I'm just sharing some of these nuggets with you that should show you that overall we've had the wrong idea and it should be moving you towards seeing God as he really is and seeing how he does things. Let me, let me show you something. If you have your Bible, you can go to Mark. Oop, way too far. There we go. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. Just show you a big misconception we have. Mark 16. I forget you have it up where you can see it. So, <clears throat> Mark 16, and we will go to, uh, let's see. <clears throat> let's go to verse, oh, let's go to verse 12. We'll start in verse 12. Nope, let's go back. We're going to go back to verse 11. There we go, verse 11. <clears throat> it says, and they, when they had heard that he was alive, and had been seen of her, so he had the testimony of Mary, they believed not, right? Talking about his disciples. After that, he, Jesus, appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, the rest of the disciples, neither believed they them. So now they've already had several witnesses come, and they didn't believe any of them, right? And these are his disciples. The very people he told exactly what was going to happen, and then it happened, and they didn't believe it had happened, Right? So these guys, weren't, they didn't have it all together. They weren't perfect. They weren't super spiritual, right? They were pretty messed up, actually. <clears throat> then in verse 14, it says, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. So these are the ones that these witnesses went to. They didn't believe the witnesses. The disciples didn't believe the witnesses. So now he appears directly to the eleven, right? Shows up. As they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, so I want you to get the picture. There's their eating, gathered together, hearing testimonies, hearing these things, and they're saying, can you believe? As if, as if Jesus, if he was going to show up, he'd show up to Mary. Come on, he's not going to show up to Mary. He's going to show up to us. We're the guys, right? You know that's what they were talking about. You know that's how they thought about it. And, and, and those other two, who, well, we just can't believe this. This is ridiculous. You know, he's dead. Let's, let's, let's figure out what we're going to do, right? And it says, then Jesus appeared unto them, right? and then upbraided them with their unbelief. So you got to get the picture. They're sitting there. They're talking about this stuff. They're pretty heartbroken. Everything's ended. They think it's going to be amazing, and they think they're going to be elevated into this kingdom that Jesus is going to be the king, and it's going to be great, and all of a sudden it's all over. Jesus is dead. Now they think it's all over. So they're sad, and they're sitting there talking about it and not believing the witnesses, and right in the middle of it, Jesus appears. Now, I don't know how he appeared. It doesn't say. It just says he appears. So, you know, it could have been like, I don't know, Star Trek, and beamed in. Zzz, there he was, you know, I don't know. But whatever it was, he appeared. Now, you know their first reaction would have been, what? You know they would have been excited, right? 
first would have been shock. Is it, is it really, is it really you? And then they would have got excited. Jesus, well, it's true. You're right. And you know, they would have got happy and run toward him. And then the first thing he says is you hard hearted bunch. I cannot believe that you didn't believe the words I was telling you. I can't because isn't that what it says? He upbraided them because of their unbelief. It didn't say he welcomed them and hugged them and they were thrilled and had a great time of rejoicing. It doesn't say that. It says he upbraided them because of their unbelief and their hardness of heart. He scolded them. So you can imagine, they all sort of run toward him. He scolds them. Why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you believe my witnesses? Why didn't you believe me? I told you and you didn't believe me. You know, they were probably all, oh yeah, you know, just kind of step back and, you know, Peter probably would have been standing there going, oh, I told you, so, you know, because he was always the big mouth, right? <laughs> and so now they got all this going on. Now watch this. So Jesus shows up, upbraids them, right? And he said unto them, go ye into all the world. Now notice, he just scolded them, got on to them, and then turns around and says, go into all the world. <laughs> now if we didn't know what this was, this almost sounds like he's exiling them, yeah. you know? I can't believe you didn't believe me. I told everybody, you know what? Just get out of here. Just go. Just, just go into all the world. Just go everywhere. Just get it out of my sight. I, I know that's not what he said. Yeah. We might have been tempted to say that. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus said, go ye into all the world. And watch this. He said to them, go ye, you. Now watch the wording. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now notice. So he's talking to them. He says, you go. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now look at the next part. He that believeth. Okay? Now, if I'm talking to you, I'm going to say you. If I'm, t and if I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about somebody out there, I would say they or he. Right? So when he said, go ye, he's talking to them, the 11. Then he says, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So you're preaching to every creature. Then he says, he that believeth. Who is that? That's the creature they're preaching to. Do you get this? This is not to the eleven. He's telling the 11, you're going to go into all the world and you're going to preach to everybody and those that hear you and believe. Okay? Now watch. And is baptized shall be saved, but they that he that believeth not, ones that hear you and don't believe, shall be damned. Right? And these signs shall follow them. Notice he was not talking to the 11. He wouldn't say them. He would say these signs shall follow you that believe. He didn't say these signs will follow you. He said these signs will follow them. Them who? The ones they preach to that believe. Do you see this? So this idea that power stopped with the apostles. No, this carried right on. He said, you're going to go preach, and it's going to be passed down to the next generation. And if they preach everything that I told you to do, because remember what he said in Matthew 28, he said, teaching them to observe, know and do all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So the whole job of the 12, or the 11, were to preach everything Jesus told them to do to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And if they did it correctly, then they would also tell the next generation the last commission, which is to command, which is to teach them to, to observe and do everything that you've been taught. And so this everything Jesus taught was supposed to have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, even up to today. But some, somebody, somewhere along the road, dropped the ball and started saying, well, Power stopped. No, what stopped was faith. See, the, God never stopped working. He was always available. But faith in God went down, and people quit believing that these signs would follow them. Now, all through history, 2,000 years, there are several good books on this, as a matter of fact, but they prove that there have been signs, wonders, healings, devils cast out, you name it, tongues, interpretation, all the gifts of the Spirit. This has occurred for the last 2,000 years. There's never been a time when all of these same things were not happening in the last 2,000 years. Often not in the mainline established church, but usually in small pockets of believers that actually took the Word of God and believed it. Right? And so it has been passed down, but now we're having to recover a lot of things that had been lost along the way. Now listen carefully. God is not restoring. For God to restore meant that he had to take it away or that he was holding it back. God is not restoring. The church is rediscovering what was there all the time. See, we keep waiting for him to restore. It's the same thing with revival. Lord, we're waiting for revival, waiting for revival. You will never find the term revival used in the New Testament. You will never say, you'll never find it in the Bible to wait for revival. As a matter of fact, what it says is, awake. And it doesn't even say, awake to a great revival. 
It says, awake unto righteousness. So we are to awake. And when you awake, revival follows. Why? Because for a revival to hit, as we would call it, it has to be birthed through the body of Christ. Because he says, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Isn't that right? But now notice it doesn't say, I'll pour out of heaven. I'll pour my spirit out of heaven. He says, out of you, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit, which had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Is that right? So the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out into the church. And out of the church, out of the belly of the church, the spirit goes out into this world. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, which was the spirit. Do you get that? So God is not dropping the Spirit on people. He put the Spirit in the church. And now the Spirit pours out of the church, out of the belly of individual members of the church. You understand that? And so as that comes out, that's where revival comes from. But it's not revival. We're not waiting for God to send a wave of revival. No, I don't, I'm not looking for revival. I'm revived. Amen? I got revived when I got born again. That's, he said, I was dead. But now I'm revived. Why? Because now I'm alive in him. And he tells me to keep that gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, stirred up in me so that I can accomplish what he has called me to do. Amen? Now, the reason I say the gift, keep the gift, uh, Paul says, told Timothy, he said, stir up the gift. Now, the only time the word the, see, some people talk about that being a gift. He doesn't say a gift. He says the gift. The only gift that was ever given ever in the Bible through the laying on of hands was the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right? We don't see a gift of healing ever given from one person to another person in the New Testament. We see the gift of the Holy Spirit passed from one person to another by the laying on of hands. The apostles laid hands on people, said, receive the Holy Ghost, and they did, and they spoke in tongues just like they did on the day of Pentecost. Or they prophesied, as we would know. Amen? So all of this works together. Now, Go back. Here's the main point. I want to get to this, and then I have to send you to break. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And watch this. And these signs, these signs, not other signs. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not other signs. I'm just saying, don't say you got this sign instead of this sign. If you have that sign, you ought to have that sign and this sign. But you can't do it without this sign. Do you get that? So these signs, these, shall follow those, what? That do what? That believe. In my name, now watch this. In my name shall they cast out devils. Notice it doesn't say if they want to. It says you will. You get that? If you believe, you will. <clears throat> so this is a description of believers. So you can actually find yourself here or maybe not. That's up to you. But this is the job description of believers. So if you're going to be a believer, this is what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I don't like that tongue stuff. Well, who asked you? It doesn't say. Matter of fact, <clears throat> it's funny because people talk about it all the time, but it, and they talk about it passing away. But if you look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, it even says, and God set in the church tongues, miracles, other things. Isn't that right? Tongues are in the church. The gifts of spirit are in the church. As long as there's a church, you're going to have gifts of healings. Yeah? The gifts of healings are the only plural gift. And it's not just gifts of healing. It's gifts, plural, of healings, plural. It's the only plural gift. You got that? But these gifts are in the church. As long as there's a church, you will have these gifts. So as long as there's a church, there's going to be healing because there's gifts of healings in the church. So people say, well, healing passed away. No, there's still a church. <clears throat> as long as there's a church, there's gifts of healings. Amen? Just another proof, right? Now watch. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Is that what it says? Yes. <clears throat> now notice up here, <clears throat> it's, not in the, um, <clears throat> it's not in red letter, but in the King James, it's in red letter, which says it's Jesus talking. Is that right? Yes. Now after this, verse 19, it doesn't have Jesus talking. Verse 19 is just continuing on. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, <clears throat> notice this. <clears throat> Show me in these verses. Now, we started back in verse 11, went all the way to verse 20. Show me in here one time where it says pray. 
Is the word pray in there anywhere? It's not in there, is it? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. Please, do you hear me? I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. I'm just saying we should pray when it's appropriate. But when it's not appropriate is when it comes to laying hands on the sick. It does not say pray for the sick. It says lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. People say, well, how do I pray for the sick? Well, technically, according to Mark 16, if you pray, you've already messed up because prayer isn't there. <clears throat> so it's not about how you pray. Jesus didn't make a deal about how you pray. He just said lay hands on the sick. So really, you don't have to pray anything. All you have to do is believe, be a believer, and lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Do you get that? Yes. Isn't this so simple? Yes. See, well, how do I, that's the number one question I get. How do I pray for this disease? How do I pray for this kind of disease? Why do I pray for this? No, you don't have to, right? Now, and especially, Jesus said, speak to the mountain, speak to the fig tree, speak to the tree, isn't that right? And it'll be plucked up and thrown in the sea, isn't that right? He never said, talk to God about the mountain. He said to talk to the mountain about God. So our job <clears throat> is not to pray to make these things happen. Our, now, our prayer time should be spent in communion and fellowship, right? Not always begging and asking God to do this and asking God to do that. T.L. Osborne said there's two things you should never ask God to do. Number one, you should never ask God to do what he told you to do. He said, number two, never ask God to do what he's already done. Now, if you eliminate asking God to do what he's told you to do and you eliminate asking God to do what he's already done, I'll be honest with you, there's not a whole lot to ask him to do. Because he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. He said, you do that. Now, I'm there with you. And it's by his spirit that we can do it. But he didn't tell us to ask, oh, God, heal brother so-and-so. Oh, God, please touch this. I mean, think about that. Think about this prayer. Because <clears throat> I've heard it. People say, well, we should pray because Jesus prayed this way in the garden. Lord, if it be thy will. Okay, first off, that's not what he prayed. He said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if not, my, your will be done, not mine. Isn't that right? <clears throat> so he didn't say, Lord, if it be thy will. He didn't say it that way. But that's how people are taught. If we're going to pray, and they do it with healing. It had nothing to do with healing. Right? It was, had to do with consecration to accomplishing what God's purpose in his life. So notice here, people always say, well, you should pray this way. Lord, if it be thy will, heal brother so-and-so. Okay, that's good. Uh, but if that's true, then you ought to finish that prayer. Lord, if it be thy will, heal brother so-and-so. And if not, kill him. I mean, isn't that the other side of the prayer? I mean, come on. <clears throat> Just finish it, right? I mean, I mean, you're saying if it be your will. I mean, if that's, that's the only two ways to go, right? And what do we, oh, yeah, Lord, just, you know, Lord, if it's your will, whatever your will is, Lord, right? And Lord, we just, I mean, think about this. You ever hear me saying, Lord, thank you for that cancer. Lord, it was such a blessing. It's such a, Lord, I know you love me so much that you had to get my attention. I was so hard-headed <clears throat> that you had to get my attention by giving me cancer. Thank you. For, matter of fact, Lord, you know, I got some hard-headed kids. <clears throat> so, Lord, I really think you should bless them with cancer. Have you ever heard anybody pray like that? Of course not. Why? Because it'd be like child abuse. And yet, that's what we accuse God of. We accuse God of things that we'd put a person in jail for doing. We have to realize God is a good father. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Isn't that right? I can tell you right now, cancer, number one, isn't a, it, it's, number one it's not a gift. Number two, it's not a good gift. It's sure not a perfect gift, right? Because cancer isn't perfect. Cancer is, it, it's, it's, the problem with cancer is that it's not perfect. You understand? Okay, one last thing, and I'll send you to break, I promise. These are just things, as I'm driving along, I'm talking to God about, and they come up, right? He said, do you want, because I deal with people sometimes that are not spiritual, and they want physical proof other than just seeing a healing, because then they're, it's funny, they'll see one, and then they'll, you know, well, how do I know that wasn't spontaneous remission? I'm like, well, man, ain't I lucky, you know? <laughs> It just so happened to spontaneously remiss after I laid hands on him and commanded it to go. What are the odds of that? Man, if I'm that lucky, I ought to go to Vegas. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's some luck, right? So, and it's funny because, but I, I said, God, how, how can I prove it to somebody? Give me, you know, something that helps prove these things on, on a natural level. He said, what happens if you cut your finger? I said, all stuff starts going to it, and, you know, it starts healing right away. He said, why do you think it starts healing right away? 
I said, my, my immune system? He said, who do you think put that immune system in you to begin with? Why? He said, because healing is my will. It's always my will. You don't have to be a believer for your immune system to start healing your finger if you cut it. It works for believers, unbelievers, anybody else. Right? And if your immune system doesn't work to do that, there is something wrong. It's not something right. It's something wrong if your immune system is not working. You get that? And that's how they know. They, they call it a, you know, a syndrome, actually, if your immune system is not working. Why? Because it's expected to work. Why? Because that's God's will. He made your human body so that it will do that. Amen? So automatically, we should see, automatically, things go rushing to that part of the body, whatever part of the body is injured automatically it does that, which proves it was God's will from the beginning for your body to be well. Otherwise, he just said, well, you know, you're just cut. That's the way it's going to be from now on. Put a Band-Aid on it and, you know, it's never going to stop bleeding. But just put a Band-Aid on it. Why? Because it's not my will. No. See, we, we have this idea. And then people say, well, but if healing, you know, I'm not sure if it's God's will. Did you go to the doctor? Well, yeah. Well, why would you do that? If it's, if it, okay, think about it. If it's God's will, he'll heal you. If it's not, you're going against God by going to the doctor. You're in sin if you go to the doctor. If it's not, do you understand? I'm, I'm being facetious, right? I'm just trying to emphasize to you. People try to use that thing, and they go, well, you know, maybe it's not God's will. You know, it, you never talk to a doctor that talks like that. You go to a doctor, he's going to try to fix it for a price, but he's going to try to fix it, right? Maybe we shouldn't pay him until after the, we're fixed. Just saying. <laughs> Might make him work harder. I, I don't know. <laughs> Amen. But do you understand? They, 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 you go to a doctor, you don't go to a doctor. Well, I'll do all that I can, but I'm not sure this is God's will. So I'm not even sure if I should touch this case. I think, I think this could be the hand of God. We're just going to let you die. How's that? Here's my bill yeah, for my consultation. <laughs> okay? <laughs> do you understand? You wouldn't go to a doctor like that. You're going to go to a doctor that says, oh, yeah, we see this all the time. We're going to beat this thing. Yeah, it's no problem. We're going to do this, 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 and it'll be done. Amen? Why? Because you want a doc. Listen, most doctors are more in alignment with God's will than most preachers. Because they go after the sickness. They want to destroy that thing. Isn't that right? And then you got preachers sometimes, well, God's will might be, you know what I'm saying? You never know God's will because nobody knows the will of the Lord. Nobody knows. You know, he works in mysterious ways. Yeah, the people that don't know him get to know him. His ways ain't mysterious. He's the most predictable individual in the universe. He's already told you how this thing's going to end. That's pretty predictable. Isn't that right? So we're going to talk about more of this when we come back. Let's take a real quick break. Okay, break's over. Let's sit back down. Let's take a... <laughs> I said it'd be quick. <laughs>